Hi everyone, this is your first studio for the Int D318 Spring 2021 session. This video is going to be on the basics of recording and editing. The idea with these videos is that they are mostly just me talking at you, uh, and rather than subjugating you to that uh, in a synchronous fashion, I thought I would allow you to watch them at a time that works best for you. So in this lecture, what we're going to cover is what is sound? How do microphones work? Different types of microphones, the different connections that microphones have, recording standards, recorder types, and recording environments. Hopefully by the end of this lecture, you will have an understanding of how to best make a recording of human language. And if you have the opportunity, you can go out and practice. To start, let's talk a bit about microphones. In order to understand microphones, we need to actually understand how sound works. Sound, very basically, is the compression of air due to particles being moved. For human speech, these particles are moved because of the movement of our anatomy, in particular our mouth. So generally we can think of sound as waves going through the air. In the diagrams below, the blue waves that have an arrow through them and the number one beside them, these represent sound. And the way that microphones generally, generally they take in the airwaves and replicate those in a digital signal. So in a dynamic microphone, which is one major type of microphone, the airwaves come in, they hit what we call a diaphragm, which is usually a small membrane, often a piece of plastic. It's labeled number two in each of the diagrams. And in a dynamic microphone, that diaphragm has a coil right behind it, that responds to the pressure of the airwaves moving. That coil is wrapped around a magnet, and together those create a digital signal that approximates the airwaves and thus the sound that entered the microphone. In a condenser microphone, a similar process happens, except in addition to the diaphragm, we can see there's another backplate, which we call a backplate, and that's labeled number three. Additionally, instead of a coil wrapped around a magnet, uh, this is all powered through basic electricity. I won't go into it a whole lot, um, but basically the backplate moves closer and further away from the diaphragm, and then that movement is transferred and becomes a digital signal, similar to a dynamic microphone. Now in this course, you're not really going to need to know the physics of how microphones work beyond the fact that they take in airwaves. Um, but to keep things simple, we can just talk about dynamic microphones. They're really good for loud sounds. They're generally cheaper and they don't require power to work. You can sort of plug one into any device that doesn't need to provide power and you will have a good dynamic microphone. Condenser mics, on the other hand, do require power because they don't have this magnet coil system. And they generally don't do as good with loud sounds, and that's not because they can't hear them for whatever reason, um, it's because they are super sensitive. So a condenser mic will actually do much better with quieter, complex sounds, um, and offer way more accurate coverage on the lower end. But on the higher end, it'll be really, really affected, and it basically won't um, be able to accurately represent the loudest of sounds because it'll just hit its peak. For human speech, it generally doesn't matter uh, what you're using. Um, we're, we're generally quiet enough that we can use dynamic microphones. Um, but if you want really the, the best possible recording apparatus, often you will want to work with a condenser microphone just because it can handle people being very quiet. So. Turning now to polar patterns and frequency responses, 
These are two measures that describe how and what a microphone can hear. There are four main polar patterns which describe the area around a microphone that it is able to pick up sound. And we'll talk about those in a few seconds. But first, let's talk about frequency response. A frequency response is just describing the actual sounds that a mic can pick up. In general, we measure sound in something called Hertz. I won't go too much into what that is. Your course pack should have more information about it. But all you need to know for now is that human speech occurs between 20 Hertz and 10,000 Hertz for the most part. The human ear, however, can actually hear around 20 Hertz all the way up to 22,000 Hertz. So we'll see later on that we actually generally like to record such that we can capture everything the human ear can hear, even if the speech sounds that linguists are mostly interested in occupy only 20 Hertz to 10,000 Hertz. Now, at the bottom of the screen, there is a frequency response graph, and this is something that you should be able to find in any microphone manual. If you can't find one of these for a microphone, don't buy it, because this shows you the sounds that a microphone can hear, and if they're not being upfront about that, it's probably not a very good microphone. The way to read one of these graphs is to look at the y-axis, which has decibels or dB at the top, and goes from 20 to negative 20. Uh, and actually, at the very bottom, there's a negative 30, but it's not written there. The x-axis runs from 0 to 22,000. Again, this is the general range of human hearing. It's including 0 to 20 hertz, so it's actually a, a little bit more. But on this graph, we have a red line, and that represents the ability of the microphone to accurately record a sound. So on the y-axis, we are measuring volume displacement, so whether or not a microphone is recording a sound louder than it was in reality, or quieter than it was in reality. Ideally, what you'd like is this red line to be flat all the way through. You want it to be at the zero mark, because that means that it's recording a sound exactly as it was made. It's not really possible, uh, just in terms of the, the physics of things, there always needs to be sort of a ramping up before, like we see here, uh, from the zero to about 5,000 hertz. Uh, but this would be a very good frequency response. Um, this is probably better than anything you're going to see in reality, even though it's not completely flat, it's still so good that it's, it's really, you know, what, what you want. If we look at this graph, though, what we see is a little bit of distortion near the end towards the 20,000 hertz range. You can see it goes up a bit, which means that the microphone will record sound a little bit louder than it really was, and then it dips down a little bit below zero, and that's it hearing a little bit quieter than it really was. This is actually a relatively small amount of dispersal from that zero line, and really this would be a fantastic microphone. Uh, this microphone would probably cost quite a lot of money because it's still very accurate. You're never going to get a completely flat frequency response, but you ideally would like to get one that is as close as possible. Again, because we're mostly concerned with human speech, really what we care about is from the 20,000 to 10,000 hertz range. Um, but if you can get it at the higher ranges uh, to be flat, that's great too. All right, so now let's talk about the polar patterns. So polar patterns describe, like I said, the area around a microphone and where it's picking up. So if we look on the graph on the right here, we have a circle. At the top, it's a zero degrees. At the bottom, it's 180. Left, it's 270. And right, it's 90. And then there's this bold line that goes all around that circle. That bold line represents the area in which the microphone is recording. Zero degrees represents directly in front of the microphone. 180 is directly behind it. Um, and, you know, the, the further away from this main center of the circle, the further away from the microphone you can be. So this is a very, very good coverage. It's what we call an omni, omnidirectional polar pattern. 
and it records all around. This is great if you have groups and you can't uh, give a microphone to each individual. It's really bad for noisy environments though, because it's picking up sound from all around, which means you can't, you have to get really far away in order to escape the microphone if you don't want noise from you to be picked up on it. The most popular polar pattern is probably this cardioid polar pattern. Um, so we can see that it, it looks a fair bit different. Um, it's covering a fair bit in front of the microphone at the zero degrees at the top, um, but then it doesn't really do a whole lot behind the microphone. It does a little bit. You can see it's dipping um, in the 270 or 90 degrees. It sort of creates this almost heart pattern, hence the name cardioid. Um, this is really good because it records in front of the microphone, but isolates sound to mostly that. So it will pick up sound from other parts of the room that you're in, but the main sound that it's picking up is going to be from in front of the microphone and, you know, a little bit to the sides, but not so much behind. Cardioid is super popular. Um, it allows speakers to move somewhat, but not as much as, say, an omnidirectional mic. Super cardioid is really similar, except uh, it also records a bit behind the microphone. Uh, so you can see that's what that little bit at the bottom is. Um, this looks sort of like a mushroom. It's great if you want to record a speaker and then have another speaker or an interviewer or something behind the microphone, and you don't want to give them separate microphones for whatever reason. But you know, it is picking up from behind the microphone, so you have to be cognizant of that. But like cardioid, it's not picking up super far from behind the microphone, as we can see, um, and the sides, it's not picking up as much either, but it does give a little bit of range of movement. And finally, we have this shotgun pattern. Um, the shotgun mics, they, are, they look like long bars. Uh, they are highly directional, which means they basically focus in a line directly in front and a tiny bit behind the microphone. They're not going to pick up a lot of noise around the sides. And if a person is in a good position to be picked up from the microphone and then moves a little bit to the right or the left, they have a tiny bit of space to sort of play in. But if they go too far, the mic won't pick them up at all. You'll see these often on top of TV cameras that are out on the street. Um, often they have like a red thing around them, which we'll talk about what that is. But, uh, Basically, these are these are really good for getting rid of sounds except for the particular speaker that you want. Um, these can be really good for recording um, a speaker in a formal environment where they're going to be sitting down. Um, but if they're going to be moving at all, it's not a great, not a great move. So now that we know what a polar pattern is and we know what a frequency response is, we can pick out a pretty decent microphone. Um, we can pick out one that represents human speech, which is zero to 22,500 Hertz. And we can pick up one that's good for the particular use that we're looking at. The other thing though that we need to know is the connector type. So microphones have to connect to devices. They in and of themselves don't record. There were four main ways to connect a microphone, depending on the particular type of device that you are connecting it to. So the four that we're going to talk about are built-in microphones, which technically don't connect, but that's okay. Uh, the phone connection, which is a very popular option. The XLR, which is the most common in professional settings. And the USB which is very common nowadays, uh, and I'm actually using one right now. Okay, so connector types built in. What we're talking about here are microphones that come with some device that you're using. They're built in, which means you have them. Uh, if any of you have a cell phone, it has a built-in microphone. That's what allows you to speak into it. But these generally aren't that great. Uh, they're usually made to allow for calls, um, but usually not for high fidelity sound recording. Um, and they often, as a result, don't have a great frequency response or noise canceling. 
but they come with a device, so they're pretty cheap, and they are better than nothing. If we look in the left photo on the bottom, we see uh, sort of a circle on the left, a rectangle in the middle, the charging port, then we have a dot, and then we have a, a grid of dots. So that lone dot is a microphone. It's a built-in microphone. Alternatively, if we look at this MacBook or general laptop here, um, we can see that there are microphones right where these speakers are. This is somewhat unique, but a lot of computers nowadays have this where the speakers and the microphones are in the same place. Um, we can talk a little bit about that if anyone has any questions, but uh, yeah, they are co-located. Um, this one, you can't even really see it. And then finally on the top right, what we have is this portable audio recording device. The things at the top of it uh, that sort of look like bars, I guess. Um, these are built-in microphones. And in this case, actually, these built-in microphones are really good. They're still not what I would personally use for uh, high fidelity phonetic analysis, but they're more than enough to record audio for a lot of different purposes, even for recording something to put online. Next, we have the phone connector. So the phone connector, I'm sure you're all really familiar with. It, it is something that at least used to be on all cell phones. Um, a lot of phones nowadays don't have them. Um, but they're often on the ends of headphones um, and a variety of microphones as well. They come in two main sizes, the 3.5 millimeter, which you see in the bottom left. It's the, the normal headphone jack. And the 6.5 millimeter, which is on the bottom right. Uh, that's usually one that it's a bit thicker. It's used in like musical recording, often in amps. It's, it's the, the thicker jack. 3.5 millimeter is the same plug as headphones, as I said, uh, but some headphones will actually come with a microphone attached to them. So most cell phones that come with headphones have a little rectangle on the cord and that's a microphone. And actually what you'll notice on those is three stripes around the metal part. Um, not all have this, but most do. And that indicates that there are, you know, two channels, so it can give audio just to the left or to the right, or each of those at the same time, it can give different audio. And then the third stripe represents the fact that it's also a microphone. Uh, if we look on the right at the 6.5 millimeter connection, there's only two stripes, uh, and that's because that one doesn't have a microphone. Same with the 3.5 millimeter on the left. The XLR connection next is extremely popular with professional equipment, um, and that's because the XLR can actually supply power. To identify an XLR connection, it's usually a metal copper tube. Uh, it doesn't have to be copper, actually. It can be sort of any metal, but a metal tube um, with three prongs on the inside. And these three prongs allow it to transmit audio, but also to provide power to the microphone. So for a condenser mic, this can be, you know, mandatory because the other connections that we saw aren't providing power. It usually requires special equipment. I've never seen a computer, for example, that has a built-in XLR input. Usually you have to have some sort of interface, uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, now USB. Uh, the connector type USB is probably one we're all familiar with. Um, it plugs right into your computer. It can supply power, which is great. Uh, the only problem is if you're plugging a microphone directly into your computer, you're relying on your computer's sound card. Uh, that's the thing that actually accepts the sound that's happening, turns it into a digital signal, and then can save it. The issue with relying on your computer's sound card is that all of the other pieces in your computer that are running at the same time may be picked up by the sound card. Uh, even if they're not picked up by the microphone, the heat from them, the vibration from them may affect the sound card, which can affect your recording. If you are really, really, really caring about the absolute most representative sound that you can get, it's probably not a great idea to record from a microphone directly into your computer. 
that said, uh, for this, for example, I'm doing exactly that. I have a microphone that plugs directly into my computer, um, and it's mostly fine. I'm not doing phonetic analysis on this um, for basically any other purpose. You can get pretty decent microphones that are USB-based nowadays. Uh, the, the other thing I guess to think about is the fact that USB is in a bit of a weird spot right now. So if we look at the cord that we see in the slide, there's actually two different shapes. Um, the one on the left, this smaller sort of rectangle oval combination is called USB-C. That just refers to the shape. Um, and the one on the left, the rectangle, the one that's probably more familiar to, at least to me, that's called USB-A. And you need to make sure that you have the right cables for both your microphone and your computer. For example, my computer doesn't have a USB-A port. Most, almost all computers do. Mine doesn't. So if I have a cable that goes for my microphone, I need to make sure that I either have adapters or some way to get the cable to plug into my computer. So that's something to think about. Uh, luckily, cables are usually pretty cheap, and almost all almost all microphones that are out there nowadays come with a cable that is either micro USB or mini USB to USB A, and it'll plug into your computer and be fine, unless you have one of these new MacBooks which don't have a USB A. But like I said, you can get adapters to make that work. Um, it'll just depend on your computer. It's usually not too expensive. Okay, now let's talk about the different microphone types. Uh, and in this one I'm talking more about is the ways that they attach or mount or are used rather than the technological differences. All right, so handheld microphones, probably the most common. We've all seen them. We've probably all used them. Uh, they can be held in the hand and they require a stand otherwise, which means they, they usually don't stand up on their own, um, particularly if they have a cable coming out of them. Handheld mics are really good because they can move with the speaker, although you have to be aware that the speaker needs to be holding it and it needs to be holding it in the right way to pick up sound from its mouth. Often, these microphones are cardioid. They're not always, but they're often cardioid, which means that the top of the microphone, this part that's a little bit flat in the picture, that needs to be facing the person's mouth because it's creating that sort of upside down heart shape. Uh, often what you'll find is that speakers, especially if they're going on for a while and they're not professional performers, will forget that they're holding the mic to their face and it'll slowly move down their body just because their arms are getting tired um, and eventually you're stopping able to hear them and people will be like, sorry, we can't hear you. And then they'll need to you know, bring it back up and this will just keep happening. Um, I will say though that handheld mics can be any microphone pattern. Um, they can also be any connector type. I've seen them from phone connections. I've seen them in USB. I've seen them in XLR and they can range insanely in price. They can be condenser or dynamic. Actually, all of these types can be either condenser or dynamic. Um, yeah, they, they range in price. I've seen some that are, you know, $20, $30. I've seen some that are thousands. Lavalier or lapel microphones are actually really good, um, especially for recording speech. And that's because they can clip onto clothing and you usually clip them somewhere around the neck. So often on the lapel or on a collar of a shirt. Uh, and, and then speakers basically forget that they're there. Uh, they can move around as much as they want, as long as the cable is long enough. And they provide a ton of mobility. As long as they're close to the uh, mouth and they have the right polar pattern that's capturing them, again, in this case, it's often cardioid, uh, that's great. And if you're doing video recording, which is something you should consider because a lot of language is nonverbal, uh, they often are really hard to see, so they, they completely disappear for the viewers of the video. Uh, in fact, this was actually kind of hard to find a picture of because so often people will wear black, have a black microphone, and it's basically impossible to see. The main downside for these is that if you aren't careful, the microphone can rub against clothing, and that rubbing will be present in 
everything the person's saying every time they move. It's unpleasant to listen to. It affects the fine-grained analysis that you want to do, and it can even ruin a word's recording. It can even make it hard to understand. Uh, in fact, in this picture, actually, I think that the microphone is probably a little bit too close to that guy's collar, um, the actual shirt fabric, which is probably going to end up rubbing against. The lapel mic, or lavalier mic, again, can vary in price, uh, can vary in connection type. Um, often you'll actually see these attached to a wireless transmitter. Um, if you're doing language documentation, I would suggest not using a wireless transmitter for two reasons. One, wireless transmitters are expensive. The microphones that go with them are expensive. Uh, two, it's possible that you're going to have a problem with the connection, even momentarily, and you know, you probably won't find out until after you're done your recording and you're going through to see what you have. Uh, I've actually lectured with these a number of times and I've always had problems. There's always been a time where I've cut out. Uh, it's usually only for a little bit, but I've always cut out and every professor I've seen doing it has had the same issue, um, such that a lot of the times we'll just yell instead. Um, it usually ends up being easier. So. Ideally, you don't really want to be using wireless. Uh, there's also the issue of, you know, you, you could actually be losing phonetic information because it, it's going to be transmitting it across long space, but we won't get into that. All right, head-mounted microphones. Uh, head-mounted microphones are microphones that are on your head. Uh, they're usually around one of the ears, uh, and then they sort of go around to the face. You used to see them a lot on, like, pop stars. I think Britney Spears mics is often what they're called, um, sort of jokingly, but they're they're usually pretty small. Um, and, yeah, they go around the ear. Some will go around the head entirely. Um, the advantage of these is that you set them to be a specific distance from the mouth, and then usually uh, they don't deviate from that distance because until the speaker takes them off, they are pretty rigid. Uh, and they are basically invisible to the speaker. They, in addition to the speaker not actually being able to see them, um, they usually forget that they're wearing them. Everyone I've ever recorded with them has forgotten at some point and stood up and been caught on the wire of the microphone. Uh, so these are actually really good and probably the gold standard when it comes to capturing, um, human speech, particularly human speech in a more natural environment. The issue with a lot of recording situations is that when you put a physical device in front of someone's face, it throws them off. There's a difference between having a conversation with your friends and having a conversation with a microphone. It's, it's more of an official situation and it, it creates not an ideal language session. Now, obviously, that's the best we can do a lot of the time, particularly as academics. Um, and it's not the end of the world if that's all you can get. But uh, the advantage of these is that speakers really, really forget that they're there and that it can feel just like having a discussion with friends or colleagues. Uh, and, and I can say that actually having been on both ends. I've done a lot of uh, recording sessions where I've recorded people. Um, but also right now I'm recording myself. I'm being recorded and I'm definitely speaking and acting differently uh, with the microphone setup that I have than I would be if I was just talking to somebody, even without trying to. The downsides of head-mounted microphones are that they are almost always, although not always, but they're almost always very expensive, um, especially the ones that are really high quality, the dynamic ones, um, or sorry, rather the condenser ones. Um, they tend to be pretty expensive. We're talking hundreds to thousands of dollars. Um, they're great, though, if you want the best quality recording. The other issue is that they will pick up any sound from the speaker's mouth because they're so close to them. We're talking inches away. So if they're chewing or laughing or sipping or lip smacking, uh, all of that will be recorded and it will be very loud. Uh, it's not the end of the world. Uh, and normally they're not doing that and speaking at the same time. But if you're listening and just recording... Um, listening to the recordings afterwards and you're not expecting it, it can be jarring. The other thing is that because speakers forget that they're there, they'll often end up like rubbing or bumping them, um, which can either push them out of alignment or 
you know, just to actually, if they're resting their face against their hand, for example, if the hand is pushing against the microphone, it's going to be an issue for recording. Also, and this is my favorite fact about them, uh, if they are one of the ones that go around the ear and somebody is wearing magnetic earrings, those magnetic earrings will, in fact, cause a little bit of a disturbance in the speech signal recorded from the microphone. Uh, it's not really audible, you can't hear it, but you can see it if you use uh, software to look at the sound, the sound wave, um, which I think is... Uh, Super interesting, never something that's covered, but uh, be careful about the earrings that your speakers are wearing. So here's a picture of what these microphones look like. Actually, everybody except for the person leaning over um, is wearing one. Uh, you can probably see it best on the woman in the blue. Uh, she's wearing it on her left ear, and then the microphone goes down her face a bit. Uh, I'm on the far left. Uh, you can see... Actually, my microphone against the white paper that's on the table just behind it. Um, it's very close to my face. But you can see how easily they disappear um, and sort of how worry-free they are because they, they go around the ears so the wire's not in the way and you can just sort of have your discussion. Um, yes, this is a picture from the uh, Muscochis Dictionary Recording Project that I was a part of, so those of you from Muscochis may know many of these people. Now we can talk about recording devices. Once we've picked out a microphone, we have to connect that to something to actually register the sound. Now we can talk about recording devices. The recording devices are the things that you actually plug the microphone into. Like I said, microphones themselves don't actually record audio. They can just take it in. In order to actually record audio, uh, the microphones plug into something and there's three main types of devices that you can connect a microphone to. So there's the integrated devices, there are the handheld devices, and then there are the external sound cards. So the integrated are basically the same as the integrated microphones, um, they're just a different part of it. Uh, so basically all cell phones and computers nowadays have microphones inside of them. Um, the advantage of these is that they're easy to use. Uh, you just click record, it saves directly to your computer or phone's hard drive or SD card. Um, we'll talk a bit about storage later, but they are automatically available because if you have the device, they work. And they're usually good enough. Uh, so, you know, we're going to be having Zoom sessions. Usually you can understand everything I'm saying. Uh, that's because unless you have an external microphone, which most people on Zoom um, don't, um, although that's changing now that we've been working from home for a year, uh, they usually are good enough for recording sound. If you just want to get a record of something that was said, uh, usually an integrated mic and computer slash phone uh, will help you with that. But we'll talk a bit about why that might not be a good idea in a few slides. 
The disadvantages to this are that, uh, in general, these things will only record to MP3, uh, and that's because, basically, uh, we're talking about phones and tablets here. Uh, a lot of them, especially Apple ones, don't want to record to WAVE, generally because WAVEs take up more space. Um, and so, an MP3 file, which we'll see in a little bit, is actually a compressed form, which means it loses information from what is actually said. Again, this information is very rarely audible, but if you're doing fine-tuned analysis where you actually have to look at the speech signal, um, such as stuff that you might be doing in Audacity later, it's kind of an important um, thing to have. Uh, when you have a computer, if you're recording something on that, usually you can find an application that will allow you to either go from wave uh, to wave or just record to MP3. Uh, the other disadvantage is that the microphones that are integrated into these, like we said, don't usually have great frequency responses, but they're usually good enough. The handheld recorder is probably your best option. In addition to being a handheld recorder, which means they're really portable, um, usually they're not, you know, much bigger than, uh, they're usually thicker, but maybe not much uh, bigger in dimensions otherwise than to a cell phone. So imagine like a cell phone that's three times as, as thick. That's probably what you're getting with something like the, the bottom one there. Um, they can also act as an external sound card. So they can be an intermediary between your computer and your microphone. Uh, Additionally, they're generally extremely easy to use. So in all of these cases, you can actually see there's like a red button that you click that records it. You click it to stop recording. Um, they come in a ton of different forms. So the topmost one that we see to our right, it's called the Zoom H1N. Uh, it's great. It's under a hundred dollars. It's around a hundred dollars at least most of the time. Um, it has microphones connected uh, on its top there and they're actually pretty decent. Um, like I said, they're very good for basically anything other than detailed phonetic analysis. And they can usually record to either WAVE or MP3. Um, other ones, like the other two that we have on the slide, in addition to their built-in mics on their top, they also have inputs on the bottom, which you can't really see in the picture. You can see there's stuff going into the bottom, but they have XLR inputs, which means you can use those XLR mics. So these are super, super versatile. Um, usually they're your best bet, and they're usually under $300, even for the, uh, the ones with the XLR inputs. So the handheld devices, if you're buying something new and you have money, they're a pretty good way to go. Uh, they also, as you can see, the uh, middle one there uh, is pretty rugged. It's called the H4N Pro. Um, they're specifically designed to be field devices, so things that you can take and, you know, drop. They're not waterproof as far as I know, but um, they, they are really good for portable field recordings. And finally, we've got our external sound cards. So an external sound card is basically just something that you use as an intermediary to plug a microphone into a computer. These handle all of the signal processing, so they take the signal from the microphone, they turn it into digital audio, and then all that it does to the computer is send it to the computer. The computer's not doing any recordings. So it doesn't matter what's going on in the computer, it doesn't matter how loud um, or hot one of the computer things are, unless the microphone's right beside them. Um, these are really good if you want the highest possible audio quality. They allow for non-USB mics to be plugged into the computer. Um, obviously, a phone jack could also go into the input to a computer as well, but XLR ones, like I said, computers don't really have those as an input. The other thing is that they allow multiple numbers of participants, and they allow separate channels. So what I mean by this is they allow you to have individual participants that have their own microphone, and each of those microphones is saved to their own file so that if you want to adjust just one person's sound, it doesn't affect everybody else. 
in the picture that we saw earlier of me doing that recording project in Musquachis, we used one of these because we had three different speakers on that single track, and each one of them was mic'd. So each one of them got saved to their own file, uh, which allows us to do a lot, especially since speakers tend to vary quite a bit in their in their volume and various other things that you might need to adjust after the fact. Uh, we can see they come in different sizes, so the the one that says zoom at the top there I think only has one, maybe two XLR inputs. The red one has two XLR inputs. The one just below the red one has eight. There's four in the front and four in the back. And then this one on the left also has eight, um, but it's more made to be plugged into a, a wall or something permanent. Um, but external sound cards are really, really good. They do all of the signal processing so that you don't have to worry what's going on with your computer. Um, they just have to be connected to your computer, so I guess you have to worry if your computer's on, but um, you don't have to worry about the heat from your computer or anything like that. Uh, they are generally pretty expensive, though, so something like that red one, I think, usually goes for three or maybe four hundred, um, depending on if it's on sale. You can get a single input one that's maybe a couple hundred dollars. The, uh, the one that we used is the one that's below the red one, and that, I believe, was eight hundred dollars. Um, Although, I will say, most of the time, you probably don't want a ton of speakers in the room. Um, for our project, it was fine, um, but you probably don't want more than a couple of speakers uh, hooked up uh, in a single recording session. So, um, you'd have to be a pretty special project to need eight different inputs. I think we used maximally six, and we only did that once or twice. Okay, so we're almost to the end of this, but let's talk about recording standards. So recording standards basically are just the things to keep in mind when you're doing a recording session. Um, environments, the areas that you're doing them in are super important. Um, you can have the best microphone in the world, but if you have a terrible recording environment, like if you're out in the middle of the uh, windy plains, it's not, it's not going to be a good recording. Um, basically, one, one thing that you need to think about is wind is really noisy to microphones and people, too, uh, but especially to microphones. And sound reflects off of hard surfaces. So things like concrete are terrible when it comes to recording environments. If you've ever been to a restaurant that has a concrete floor, you'll notice it's always extremely loud. And that's because all of the volume from everybody's voices, they're basically just reflecting off of the concrete floor. Often those places have concrete walls as well. Um, and if they don't have a lot of stuff on the walls, these sound waves are just bouncing around. They're not dissipating, they're not being absorbed, and it just gets really loud. Um, so you generally don't want to be in places that have a lot of uh, hard surfaces, things like kitchens, garages, unfinished basements. These are not great for recording. Uh, you also want to avoid general ambient noise. So, you know, if you're going to be near a refrigerator that's humming, which mine is in the background right now, um, probably if you're looking for the best possible audio quality, don't do that. Uh, don't, for example, do a recording near a railway, um, if at possible. I've had to do this a number of times. Uh, sometimes you hear a train coming and you just have to say, okay, well, stop. We're going to have to get some stuff repeated. And then you wait until the train goes, but trains can be a while. At the same time, though, you want to balance the customer or the subject's comfort. So you don't want to be forcing people to go into places that they're not super comfortable in. Uh, this is the issue with recording booths. So these are basically giant foam booths. Foam is great, it uh, absorbs sound, so it doesn't have these reflection issues. And it's one of the best, more soundproof environments that you can have. Uh, you can see a picture of me here in one. Um, I, I posed for this picture, I wasn't doing an experiment. But uh, the problem with them is they're kind of creepy because they're small and they're really hot. And they're really quiet, obviously. And so... If you're looking for the most naturalistic speech, which often we are, you don't really want to put someone in that environment. 
if possible. Uh, but a lot of the times you care more about the exact sound that you're getting from it. And in which case, you know, maybe it's important. That's why, for example, studios will have specially built rooms that are, you know, very soundproof specifically for that reason. They don't really care if the singer is comfortable. Um, it's a job. And, you know, similarly, that, that goes for other environments, too. So, like I said, kitchens aren't great. However, if being in your speaker's home, in their kitchen, makes them feel at ease, you're probably going to get a better recording. Uh, so, make sure that you balance, you know, what's the best environment I can get, but what's going to give me the best language that I want to hear. And, in general, a policy is that something is better than nothing. If you have the opportunity to record an elder telling a story or giving a teaching and they're okay with you recording because you want to make sure that people are aware and okay with you recording, then if all you have is your phone that has a not great microphone, that's still better than not having the recording at all. Because if you don't have the recording, nothing can be done with it. All the things I've been teaching you are idealizations. they are ways to get the best possible audio. And the idea with this is, okay, audio that's the highest quality can be used in the most ways. And if you have the highest quality audio, people can choose what they're going to do with it in the future. You can choose what you're going to do with it in the future. Uh, if you record in low quality audio, your options are limited. You can't really make audio higher quality than it was recorded in. So, that's why we're sort of giving you the gold standard. But really keep in mind that some recording is better than no recording. And if something is worth doing well, it's also worth doing poorly. Uh, as one of the uh, instructors at the university has told me, uh, I think it's actually a good motto. Now let's talk about the actual standards of recording standards. So for phonetic analysis, you want a DAW wave file. If you're trying to figure out the intricacies of the sounds being made, rather than simply a record of something so that you can write it down or something so that people can associate writing with a sound, you're gonna wanna use a DAW wave file because these files are uncompressed. This means that they are a direct representation of what your recorder picked up. The most popular file type is a .mp3, and these are compressed files. That means that they were taken from an uncompressed source, and then they were compressed into a smaller file size, with some information being discarded. For the most part, this information isn't audible to the human ear, but it is something that comes up in phonetic analysis, and so an mp3 cannot really be used to do professional phonetic analysis. On the other hand, MP3s are a much smaller file size than a dot .wave. Now, a dot .wave can be saved as an MP3 later, but once something is saved as an MP3, you can't really go backwards unless you have the original file. Uh, if something's saved as an MP3, that is the highest quality that that particular file is going to have. When you're recording waves, you should always make sure to record them in 44.1 kilohertz and a bit depth of 16 bits. I won't talk about these too much or what bit depth is. The course back talks about it, I believe. But the idea here is that by recording double what the human ear can hear, which again is, is around 22,000 hertz or 22 kilohertz, um, we're making sure that we capture everything the human ear can hear. So if you record less than 44.1 kilohertz, you may be losing some phonetic information. It may not be exactly in the human speech sound era, area, but you may lose some information. So the standard is 44.1 kilohertz and 16 bits. Now this is super common. Most recorders will actually tell you or have this as a default or allow you to change it to this. Now the standard of 44.1 kilohertz and 16 bits concerns your recording devices, not the microphones themselves. Microphones pick up sound, but they don't do the recording, which means things like sampling rate, which is what the kilohertz is referring to, or bit depth, don't really apply to microphones. 
So just keep that in mind if you're trying to find out if it can record 44.1 kilohertz or 16 bits, your microphone probably won't say that, but your recorder definitely should. As I mentioned before, you can never really uncompress a file, so make sure that you are recording to the highest quality that you could ever possibly need um, the first time. Now, archives may have their own standards. Um, oftentimes, archives want a 96 kilohertz with a 32-bit depth. Uh, most of the time, these are references to sounds that aren't human speech, so the uh, sampling rate and the bit depth are a bit different. Um, check with your archive to see what the standard for the recording is if you're planning to archive any of your work, which you should be. Uh, do this at the start so that you don't record stuff and then find out, oh, my archive won't take it. Now, talking about accessories, uh, there's a lot of accessories. We're not going to get into all of them. The main ones I want to talk about are wind screens or wind socks, depending on how you want to talk about it. That's those foam things that you'll often see on top of mics. I said like on, on TV cameras that are filming on the street, often they'll be red. Um, that's just for like visibility. Um, Basically, these are just foam pieces that go over top of your mic. They allow speech sound in. They don't allow wind in. It's really good. It cuts down on wind if you're in a windy environment. If you're going to be recording outside, even if you think it's not windy, use one of these. Then we have something called pop filters. Um, these are good for sounds uh, like so or pa um, because these sounds cause mics to peak. And what I mean when I say peak is that they're really loud and... If you say them and you don't have a pop filter, a neutral microphone will usually not be able to hear all of the sound. So it may, let's say if you have a frequency between, I don't know, let's say you have a frequency response of up to 23,000 Hertz um, and like five decibels, let's say. If your P sound, your P is going to be more than five decibels, your microphone's not going to hear it very well. It's going to lose some information because it, it can't hear over a certain loudness. Um, usually that's not as much of an issue. Uh, usually it's a matter of the frequencies, particularly with su. Um, it's a high frequency sound. If it goes like above 23,000, um, you're going to have some troubles uh, because if your microphone can't pick up that, uh, it's not going to be able to send that to your personal audio recorder. So what a pop filter does is it, like this little ping pong paddle looking thing, is uh, essentially a thin material of fabric that allows most sound through, but dampens the super high frequencies or the super high loudness um, and actually keeps the rest. So it allows you to avoid the issue of peaking, but it still records your voice naturally, or the voice of whomever you're recording naturally. Uh, I'm using a pop filter right now because the microphone that I have uh, is really good. It, it records only the specific sounds um, that it hears. It doesn't have this pre-processing where it tries to get rid of certain sounds that it doesn't like. Um, some microphones, particularly USB microphones, will do that. It can be good if you don't want to have to actually deal with... Um, phonetics or speech processing, but I do. So basically I got this microphone. The downside is my so's and pos are really loud to it. So I got a pop filter and I'm going to say some sounds with the pop filter first, and then I'm going to say some without. So pop pattern, pop pattern, simple, simple, Sarah, Sarah, all right, now without. Pop, pop, pattern, pattern, simple, simple, Sarah, Sarah. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of uh, an idea of what a pop filter can do. Um, again, it's not always the end of the world, but it is something to keep in mind. Uh, if your microphone is peaking, uh, it's it's not a good thing. So they're really cheap. I think I got mine for like $10. Um, I would go ahead and get one. 
remember to always use a stand for your mic um, if you need one. Uh, so if you have a lavalier mic, you don't really need a stand. Um, but otherwise, most mics need stands. Um, I guess also if you have a head-mounted mic, you don't need one. Uh, but it's something that's easy to forget about. And uh, if you don't have one, the microphone isn't a whole lot of use. Then we've got uh, SD cards and general storage. So uh, if you're recording to a computer, you usually have a hard drive in the computer. Um, if you're recording to WAVE, you need to make sure that you have enough storage for that. Uh, I generally suggest if you're starting a new project, buy an external hard drive. They're usually about $100 for a lot of storage. Um, and, you know, back up your recordings to that. Um, so record during the day, at the end of the day, when you're done recording, before you do anything else, back up to an external hard drive. Make sure that external hard drive is away from your uh, recording apparatuses otherwise, um, because, you know, if something happens and they're close together, if something happens to one, it'll happen to the other, and you've lost everything. So uh, you need you need storage. Um, a lot of personal audio recorders actually use these tiny little... Uh, micro SD cards or SD cards. Uh, a lot of cell phones are using them now too. Uh, cameras. So these tend to be pretty cheap. Uh, not quite as cheap as external hard drives, but uh, they're still pretty cheap. Uh, you just need to make sure that you have the right amount of recording space. Um, so what I would suggest again is with a personal audio recorder, at the end of the day, uh, make sure that you've backed up all of your stuff to an external hard drive and then delete the day's recordings from your recording device um, after you've 100% made sure that you've backed it up. You can delete them from the recording device and then uh, you can just go through the next day and you'll have enough space probably. Most audio recorders, even with just their built-in storage, have enough to be about eight hours of recording or so um, at a WAV file size. Uh, you just really need to make sure that you have enough storage um, because what you don't want to happen is you go out to record, you realize you have a bunch of recordings on your device, you don't want to delete those because you don't have them backed up anywhere, and instead, uh, you've gone, you have to record someone, you have no space, you can't record them, or you have to lose some old recordings. Uh, it's not a great situation to be in, so uh, really just be aware of that. Personal audio recorders will usually tell you, um, like on the screen, it'll actually say like you have this many hours left, um, so just be aware. Uh, and again, this is an advantage to MP3 is that they take up a lot less space. Then finally, a really good accessory to have is, you know, a headphone set. So these don't have to be expensive. You can get really expensive headphones. Um, for human speech, you really don't need them. Uh, these are just to monitor to make sure that the sound that's going into your microphone or into your sound card uh, is actually the sound that you want. Uh, you can get these fairly cheap. You know, you can use the ones that come with your phone. Um, they either plug in directly to a microphone or into your sound card. Depends on the microphone and sound card. And then that just allows you to hear sort of what your computer is is going to take in. Um, and it can be good because it can tell you if you have a speaker who is really far from a mic, let's say, and you thought they'd be louder, but they're not. Um, otherwise, you might not find out that there's an issue until after you're finished recording. So... That's, it's always a good thing to have on hand. They don't have to be expensive. The only downside to that is if you have headphones on while you're trying to do some sort of elicitation session or some sort of interview, um, one, it looks weird and can cause troubles with your sort of interactions with the speaker, but also it, it can be really distracting to have that going on while they're speaking, while you're trying to monitor a bunch of other things. So usually, you know, if you can, you'd have a person whose job is to just monitor the recording, including with headphones. Okay, we can sum up now. So in this lesson, what we covered was the idea that mics are basically just picking up sound waves and turning them into electrical signals. And there's different ways that different types of microphones can do this. We have at the very, very high level, we have just dynamic versus condenser. Um, dynamic is, is great in most cases. Condenser is really good if you really want accurate sound that's not super loud. And when I say super loud, I mean like incredibly loud, like higher than most humans' voices can be. Uh, the microphones can be measured in their frequency response and their polar patterns. 
So these will tell you for frequency response the actual sounds that they pick up, and you want it to be between 0 and 22,500-ish hertz. Um, and also their polar pattern, which is the area around the mic that it's actually picking sound up from. Um, and that will depend on your actual needs, what you want to choose. So be aware of that. Uh, do not buy a microphone if you can't find its frequency response chart and its polar pattern chart. Uh, it's usually in the manual of the microphone. Um, if you're really confused and you like really love a microphone, um, but you can't find that, you can email the manufacturer. Um, but it should be easy to find, and if it's not easy to find, it's probably not a very good microphone. Um, that said, there are lots of bad microphones that make it easy to find as well, but uh, I digress. Uh, there is also a few different types of recording devices that we talked about, um, and a few different types of microphone connections. To attach a microphone to those recording devices and then there's also different recording standards so that's all that i have for this lesson um, i think i would close by saying once again uh, something is better than nothing and uh, the best tool is the one that you have with you so don't don't allow these sort of high high um high quality idealizations stop you from recording because Something is better than nothing. Um, the rest of this unit, so this week and the next week's um, lessons, are going to be from various sources online. Uh, they're going to be from some uh, recording standards and also just documentary standards uh, that you can use. There's going to be a link to that on the website. Uh, there will also be links to how to use Audacity, which is the most popular um, audio editing and recording software. Um, these are great. These were done by the First People College uh, in British Columbia. And the other last component is going to be the same more tutorial by um, Andrea Braz Croker. This one, not everyone's going to be able to do. Audacity is great. It works with pretty much everything. Um, it won't work like on your iPhone. I don't know if it'll work on your Android, but it'll work on Chromebooks. You may have to install something through a Linux system, but um, it should there should be a way to get it to work on um, even Chromebooks. But same word is only for Windows. So if you don't have a Windows computer, you can't really use it, which is why it's not part of the assignment. But same word is really good for... Uh, having metadata, so explaining what a project, what a recording is, who set it, what the purposes of it was for, who's annotating it. And it's also really good for making sound and audio match up. Uh, when this course is traditionally taught uh, during the Silly Summer School, that makes up the majority of the course. But because we can't really do that, um, just given that not everybody has Windows computers, uh, things are a bit different in this course. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to say to the course pack from the 2019, I think 2019 um, year is a really good resource. Uh, don't listen to any of the assignments. We have different assignments in this course than that course. Um, but the actual sort of lecture information is really good. And there is an Audacity tutorial in there as well. Um, and there's also some good tidbits about, you know, microphone suggestions and things like that, um, which is going to help you for your uh, assignment one and assignment two even. Uh, so let me know if you have any questions. Um, you can shoot me an email. Uh, otherwise, I will see you guys in the live lecture next. Uh, hopefully this was helpful, and I hope you have a good day.